everybody, what's up? We're here. Rodney Barnes is in the waiting room. Are you guys ready for Rodney Barnes? Because this is a uh, this is a cool. This is gonna be epic. You guys ready to get stoned? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're just gonna let him in. Let him in. Let Bring him, him on. Rip and run. The man of the hour. Make him a co-host. Give him access. Yes, that would make it easier. Hey, <laughs> what's happening, yo? The man. You doing, Rodney? There it is. And anytime I get to hear Cody, I was actually tired. <laughs> and it's something about Cody's voice. <laughs> so how's how was Comic Con for you, Rodney? Oh, I'm sure I got COVID or Ebola or something. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was cool. It was cool. Very busy. I had a lot to do while I was there. So uh yeah, it was busy, but cool. Cool. Nice. Do you ever get overwhelmed when you do the cons? Um, I don't people well. I don't know if it's because I'm an old man and I'm afraid that, you know, they're just going to take advantage of me. Um, <laughs> like in a riot. But um, when I'm where I'm supposed to be, I'm good. When someone says you have a panel in five minutes and it's over in a 17, whatever. And I, this is the first time I've been to this place and I have no idea where I'm going. Then I start to get like, you know, why, why am I here? I could be home watching a game, and, you know, <laughs> doing something. but it's all good. It's all nice. good. Nice. Yeah, it was it was a cool time. I heard you ran into Anthony. At I did. I did a couple times. A couple, couple of times. times. Yeah. <laughs> Anthony was cool. Anthony was cool. I find all of you guys like out in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> we get around. We get around. <laughs> Comics of Chronic. We keep our ear to the streets out there. Yes, it's a lot of it's a lot of y'all like all over the country, just kind of floating around in the streets. It's like it's kind of like being a crip. You know, you think the Crips are just in LA, <laughs> but they're all over the country. You know, it's like, <laughs> have you heard about the Detroit Crips? No, I haven't. You know, it's <laughs> you know, it's like you guys. It's everywhere I go. I could be in the most remote of places. Like, hey, you remember us? Yeah. I, I, why are you here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I feel honored to be compared to uh, the Crips. <laughs> <laughs> I meant it as though an organization that has a membership group that no one knows exactly how many of them there are. <laughs> you know, so I don't know if they keep track. You know, I don't know if they keep, like, you get a badge or, you know, some type of number on your scarf. <laughs> Nice. Well, thank you so much for coming on. and We're glad you actually... Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, we wanted to do something special for our Patreon subscribers and for you know October being spooky season. And uh, we're actually really glad that you picked The Exorcist. Yeah, One of my favorite movies, if not my favorite movie of all time. Oh, nice. David, now, is, is it your favorite movie or favorite horror? Or yeah, both? Good question. A little bit of both. A little okay. bit of both. It's like if you talk to me during um, like Apocalypse Now, the final cut is up there. Um, it's a few movies that are interchangeable, but The Exorcist never drops below three. Nice. nice. I respect that. I mean, arguably the best horror movie of all time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's perfect in a lot of different ways. Um, I think from the acting, the casting, the music, uh, the cinematography, the pacing, the special effects, the practical effects, the sound effects are incredible. Mm. Um, it's certainly yeah, in these fine. latest, the 4K that was just released, and there are a couple of others. It's like there's so many things. There are a couple of things if you use today's standards, like when she's floating, you can see the wires if you look really, really close. Yeah. But, um, you know, it was 1972, I believe. So I can let that one go. I've seen worse <laughs> in 2023. So, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. I would take these effects over most of the the more recent Marvel. Yeah, movies. the practical yes. effects. <laughs> yeah, the practical effects of yesterday. I would take over a lot of the CGI and that stuff because once I see the CGI, it feel it takes me out of it. It doesn't feel it's so spectacular that it just goes against reality. So, yeah. Yeah, it really is cool. And there's so many, like, there's so few, because I find it, like, at, uh, going back to, like, I didn't see The Wires, but there are so few things about this movie that you can, like, kind of, like, catch and laugh at. Mm -hmm. The only thing I had with this movie is, like, they, like, look at this girl. Her veins are green. Her, she's got cuts everywhere. And they're like, nah, she's just sick. She got Yeah, sick. it's, she's it's fine. Oh, <laughs> let, me, let me defend. All right. <laughs> when she first went to get the spinal tap, 
she still looked like sure. a human yeah, being. Right. By the time they do the hypnosis and she's kind of white and she grabs the guy in the crotch, you know, yeah. when he's like, I'm talking to the person inside of you, you know, Captain Howdy and all of this. And she starts growling. Yeah. Um, she's still kind of human ish. She's a little whiter than any human being I've ever known. <laughs> but by the time she gets green, <laughs> I think I think they've given up. I'm thinking yeah. like, hey, yeah. we don't know what to do. She's yeah. fine. You know, Maybe. she's <laughs> it's like a kid, it's it's like um a poor person with no insurance. You'll be okay. You know, it's like and you, you walk in the county hospital. It's like, no, it's a guy. I was shot in my shoulder. No, 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 no. You're good. Really, really, really. Here's some tweezers and you know, we'll see you later. But I think it's <laughs> the tone of them when they have there's a scene. When they're in the conference room, all the doctors and psychologists and all of this stuff. And then mom comes in and they say, uh, have you ever tried like a witch doctor, a shaman and an exorcist? And I think at that point they'd given up because yeah. conventional medicine couldn't really come to a diagnosis. So I think part of that of they're looking at her and they say, hey, this person doesn't look human. I think they just given up at that point. That's a good point. Yeah. I never thought about it like that. So you mentioned that spinal tap scene, and I feel like out of all the scenes in the movie, that one's the hardest for me to watch. Like that felt the most real. Like when you see that needle going into her neck, like the way well, like and she makes a sound when the needle is going in her. Yes. That actually enhances what you're talking about. She makes like, eh, like a little kid, and she sounds yeah. like this little kid that's being tortured. And to me, that like emphasizes what you're talking about. Yeah, and I and I remember I know there were like news stories of people like fainting in theaters, and it was because mm -hmm. of that scene. It wasn't like the the other scenes. Like it was that scene that most people couldn't take, which I thought was pretty interesting. No, no, it got me too because I still don't like needles to this day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you can't put the heroin in some fr frosted flakes or you know, you know, cookie, uh, I'm not gonna be a heroin addict. So um, yeah, the needle got me too. Any of that kind of stuff, but I think you needed that stuff. Back to the argument about you know her not being normal. I think you needed to go through this journey of trying conventional medicine. And part of that was the needles and this is what they do. And they go through all of this stuff to set the x-rays. And when they have pictures of her uh, cranium and, you know, yeah. all of that stuff up there, you need to plausibly believe that they went through everything they could possibly go through to say that it's not this before you get to that. That's yeah. Cool. Like a yeah. movie we, the, we haven't put out the episode yet, but Hereditary mm -hmm. very, very much felt. Have you seen that? I've seen. Yeah. I don't remember it as well as The Exorcist that I've seen almost 300 times, but I think I saw it once. Yeah. Yeah. There was a cool scene in the dark, I think, up in the corner. And yes. you don't yeah. see it and stuff. That, yeah. That's what I remember more than anything else was another movie did that too. And I'm trying to figure out how to write that into something where there's this thing in the room and you don't see it. And another conversation is happening. You go, oh, shit, there's a thing. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, yeah, that, that seems yeah I, I feel like Exorcist does that a lot. Uh, like, not not quite subliminal because I think, like, I I, I was reading that uh, they were giving the director uh, a gr guff for like using subliminal messaging, and he was like, "If you saw it, it wasn't subliminal." You right. know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I think. Um, William Friedkin and uh, William Peter Blatty. It was funny because um, William Friedkin just passed away. And um, mm -hmm. I got a chance to see The Exorcist with him doing a Q&A at the oh, Academy uh, Museum cool. probably about four or five months before he passed. And he was talking about what you were talking about of um, that very thing, because there were some scenes William Peter Blatty wanted, didn't want it to be, always wanted you to feel like... Um, Kind of like Christopher Nolan, like everything is plausible, like everything in a Batman movie that he did, a human being could do. It never went into a place of he went out in space and just had a mask on his face or, you know, something <laughs> like that. Yeah. And there were some things in the movie, like when her head did the 360 degree turn and some of the other things that in the back, uh, the crab walk down the steps that's in the director's cut. Yeah. Like some of those things defy because you could tell she's not really touching the ground, those things sort of degrad, um, defy uh, gravity and physics and all of that. And um, they found a middle ground. But yeah, 
So do you have a preference between director's cut, theatrical cut? That's a great question. I'm waiting for Blade Runner had this issue as well. I think they're like five different Blade Runners. And the final cut of Blade Runner and Apocalypse Now are my favorites. I'm hoping one day, because that's how they keep eating off of this movie, is releasing cuts. You know, we got a 4K. (laughs) We restored this. We restored that. If there's ever... And I know, you know, directors pass now, so it's difficult to do. But I think there's a middle ground somewhere in there of... I like some of the stuff that's in the director's cut. Not everything. You know, some of the extended stuff that you cut out, that's noticeable. I just like seeing her more, Linda Blair, as we progress um, into her becoming, you know, the demon coming out of her. Um, I like that part of director's cut. Some of the other talking, it was like a lot of talking. (laughs) I also, we were talking about how the director's cut and the theatrical cut have different versions. I think I like the let the more bleak version of the mm-hmm. theatrical than the mm-hmm. kind of hopeful directors. Yeah. Uh, when they get to the end, I mean, I think um, there is something about, obviously the theatrical cut is one of the reasons why we're having this conversation today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you got to give, if you, if you put a gun to my head and you say, which one do you, if you only could have one, I'm going to say the theatrical cut, because that's the one that sort of changed the way horror films were perceived. Right. But I don't think you can really go wrong with either one of them. Yeah, that's I, fair. I like, I like the horror genre that deals with like demons and possession. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're the hardest to do. I mean, as uh, in Nita Hall's Nightmare blog, I had a demon and, you know, I'm always thinking of, I got this weird fixation with trying to, things that I admire growing up and as a writer, I'm always trying to not necessarily compete with to see if I have one of those in me. Like, can I nice. possibly somehow get close to this thing? And The Exorcist is so far out there and in so many different ways. And it came at a time. So it hadn't been done before. And now, if you do anything that's similar to it, you go, oh, it's The Exorcist. We saw that in The Exorcist. Yeah. And it almost ruined, I won't say ruined, but the de- demonic possession genre, I can't think of a way to do it without thinking of The Exorcist. And even if you do it well, you're still comparing it to The Exorcist. That's a good point. You know, in some way. It's like The Sopranos or The Wire, or they do such a great job at doing what they do that they become now the template for everything that comes after. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a good point. You no, know, even when we did Hereditary, we were like, oh, this scene pays homage to Yeah. Exorcist. Yeah. Um, yeah. That or Rosemary's Baby. I'm a huge Rosemary's right. Baby fan. I am too. It comes on, um, it's been coming on a lot. It came on Turner Classic Movies the other day and um, I think Epics or somebody had it on. I always give it, I never come from the beginning into it. I always get it midway through when uh, <laughs> at a certain point where you realize Mia Farrell is not getting out of that house. <laughs> <laughs> it's the reason all these visitors keep coming over. Yeah. <laughs> so we, had a, we were talking amongst ourselves about like demons and whatnot. And we actually, it's funny that you brought up. <laughs> we were uh, talking amongst ourselves. No, we, when we, <laughs> it was when well, we had done her. The demons within us were talking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paluzzo exactly. and all of them, they were talking. To. <laughs> and then I was wondering if maybe you just happen to know anything about this in general, but uh, okay. So you have like Etrigan in the DC universe and he's a rhyming mm-hmm. demon. Mm-hmm. And then also like in ex- in this exorcist, he's not a rhyming demon, but he even says like, don't listen to what the demon says. He'll try to mess with your yeah, mind. Trick you. He misses <laughs> the lies with the truth. Exactly. Try yeah. to trick you. And then going back to Nita Hawes, you had the blue singer demon who also mm-hmm. rhymed. Mm-hmm. Is there anything to like, uh, just cause like, I, I don't know anything about like, I don't know. Maybe you do it about like the Bible is a rhyming demon, like a real lore thing within the religion itself. When you try to get like, um, the Pied Piper, when you go back into certain forms of mythology, you know, not the children's books, but when you go to the things that were those things were based on, a lot of times that whimsical rhymer, trickster, um, even a Nazi sometimes is described that way in mm-hmm. folklore of um, using rhymes to sort of seduce you and just being an entertainer and being so charismatic that you know the devil in the garden of eden you know sort of tricked eve and was able to seduce her you know uh, with his 
Well, I was going to say with his tongue, that would have been a different story. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, there's a whole different Bible. Uh, you know, <laughs> might be a great idea. Nah, I, know. Know. <laughs> I would read oh, that one. Like, read uh, different that Bible. One. Yeah, yeah. Different <laughs> Bible. the adult version. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that um, any of those, what it used to represent, it doesn't anymore because now hip hop is all about rhymes and all of that. But back in that day, um, rhyming was seen as something that I think was um, somehow rhyming and lying were sort of cousins in a way. Uh, okay. If you look at mythology and pan and all of the various iterations yeah. of there's always in every form of mythology, there's a there's an evil, you know, there's the bad guy yeah. somewhere. He typically is really cool. <laughs> he's the coolest one you know like they're all planning on what I mean, we're gonna all do all bad guys the coolest one yeah he walks in own. he's ha 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 look at everybody and he's smiling <laughs> and you know talking shit ramen <laughs> that's awesome yeah you know we were we were going back and forth about that what, what, what's your like favorite scene in this movie that's a tough one because a lot of times the scenes that to me that make it great aren't necessarily just the scenes with her in the bedroom. Those are like icing. I think the cake, when Chris McNeil is walking back from Georgetown after acting, she sees the kids like in Halloween with their costume and they're playing tubular bells. And she's just walking through Georgetown and she stops and she sees Father Karras, his mother's just died and, you know, he's being consoled. But those scenes where you're setting up character and sort of um, making those scenes grounded, in a way and make it real. So when the fantastic stuff happens, you know, and she's floating and vomiting and all of that kind of stuff, we've sort of laid the groundwork to actually know these characters in a way that you don't want anything bad to happen. You set up a sense of empathy, which is what I think horror, great horror does is you get to know the protagonist, you get emotionally invested in them. Something bad comes in this case, the devil and or a demon. And you don't want, you know, you don't, you've invested now, you don't want anything bad to happen. So I thought those scenes, you know, there's a scene when uh, Father Marin tells Father Karras to go get some holy water, go do something, go get something. And he, he walks away and it's at night and he's running down these steps. Um, scenes like that, those are like my favorite scenes. Um, you know, when Burke comes, when she's in bed and the window is open and you know, we know as an audience that something has happened to Burke. But yeah. they don't know. They just think the window's open. Burke left the window open. In a way, he kind of did. But um, <laughs> yeah, those types of scenes <laughs> are my favorite scenes. Oh, and him getting off the train. Him getting off the train and it's like, can you help an old altar boy? You oh, know, oh, and then um, that voice comes back. Yeah, and that voice yeah. comes back. It's like, and then the train comes by. When the train comes by, the shadows go across the homeless man's face. And when he's having a nightmare, he goes back to that scene. But those things that play on guilt as well, because he was the guilty priest, uh, yeah. which is, you know, huge in Catholicism of um, mm. that idea of guilt and how it manifests in a person. I mean, like this movie has always been scary for that element. Like I was raised, like I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself Catholic anymore by any means, but that's how I was raised. And I like had those beliefs as a kid. So like The Exorcist was always the scariest movie for that reason. Like what's the worst thing that could happen to me as a little Catholic boy, like being possessed by the devil? It would make me, I said it the other day. I was <laughs> like, um, I could, I went to church for like three, a good three months. After watching The Exorcist, <laughs> yeah, it got harder every week. It, it got harder every week that, that the months were going on. I was like, okay, and then, you know, Amityville Horror brought me back to being a heathen, I guess. <laughs> but uh, it, it it had a, a a strong effect. Had a strong effect. I would recast Anthony as uh, Father Karras in this. Oh, I okay. <laughs> yeah, I can do it. <laughs> yeah. One of the things <laughs> that you had mentioned earlier, you had mentioned that you. It, the, I agree that the pay. I love that this is like both like a slow burn, but also like a very there's not not a moment wasted. You know what I mean? No, no. I thought um like when I the thing I was mentioning about the pacing, even when it was funny. I had this conversation the other day about how um, you couldn't really make The Exorcist today unless it was an indie movie and like somebody backed it like back in the day, like apocalypse now when they give you 30 million and say, go come back with a movie. But if you try to do a movie like that, when you think the first half hour to 45 minutes, nothing really happens. 
you know, it's you have Father Marin over in a rock on a dig, and you know, he sees the statue of the demon, and the two of them face off, and some creepy stuff is there. But there isn't like when you go see a horror movie today, within the first five minutes, there's got to be somebody dies, there's a big jump scare, there's something to, to jump us into, um, to get us into the movie. So I don't know if you could make it today, but um, glad it was me. Weirdly, one of the biggest jump scares in this movie for me was like, there's a phone ringing. <laughs> like, just yeah, added yeah, yeah. What? <laughs> and he goes like that. Yeah, when uh, when he's listening to the backwards talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah that one. Yeah. yeah, when he's listening to it, and then the exactly. phone rings and he jumps. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I always like that 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 white demon face that flashes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's, that's the demon. Yes, and it's that's easy. in the director's cut more. Yeah, when. Um, yeah. The phone is ringing off the hook and she's trying to get in the house when well, she walks in the house and the faces are like everywhere. And then she turns the light on the faces. Don't they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. That face. Uh, but the creepiest part of when they show that is when um, uh, she's in the hospital and the, fl- the face just flashes mm-hmm. like, just that quick, that quick mm-hmm. flash. Captain Howdy, that dude. Yes. Yes. Captain Howdy. <laughs> so. In the theatrical cut, they don't actually say the demon's name, right? They don't ever say... No, that, they say know. it in the book a lot. They yeah, say it in the book okay. a lot. And I think in this, they talk about it in the sequels as well. Yeah, it's hard. To, the only sequel I think um, I was telling one of you guys is I worked on... I was a PA on uh, The Exorcist 3. Oh, yeah, you told me that at Comic-Con, yeah. Yeah, which is my favorite um, book, actually. I love the book. I actually love the book as much as I love The Exorcist. Nice. But they talk about them a little bit in uh, in that one. Nice. So there's multiple Exorcist books as well? Two There's uh, uh, that I'm aware of. There's The Exorcist and then there's Legion, both by the late, great William Peter Blatty. And um, it's the same demon. Mm. And it's Father Karras. And he's sort of been reanimated uh, by the demon. And he becomes the Gemini killer. And he starts killing um, people around D.C. and Georgetown. And... You know, the detective, you know, the detective that was in um, The Exorcist, he since he's familiar with it, he's investigating the case. And uh, George C. Scott plays him in the um, in The Exorcist three. But he's he has a relationship with Father Karras. So it's basically about the two of them and the team. I don't hate that plot. Like, I kind of want to No, it was really I I thought it was um, it's an above average horror film. It's above average. It's not. If again, the problem is if you keep comparing it to The Exorcist, anything is going to fall short of that. But in the if we look at the pantheon of those movies, I make it number two by far. Nice. nice. I love the relationship and the like the with the father and his mom and. Mm-hmm. Uh, that whole dynamic. Damn it, why you do this? Oh, damn it. <laughs> why you do this to me? You're not my mother. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, um, going back to some of the scariest moments being not the jump scares, you see Father, not Karis, who's the other one? The one, the exorcist. The uh, Father Marin. Yeah, Father Marin. He dies off screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Max Van Sada. Sada. Yeah. Oh, good point. He's just there in the holy waters, tipped over on yeah, the side. Over. And he's like slumped over. And he's then, just slumped over, yeah. yeah. And she's giggling. And yeah, she's, she's giggling. giggling. She's just like chilling there, yes. watching, giggling. Yeah, she looks like a kid with that impish little laugh. Yeah. yeah. I, I just always like, I didn't, because this is my first time. I haven't re- I rewatched it today. I haven't watched it like easy over 10 years. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize. I watched you- it two weeks ago. Oh, I think. <laughs> yeah. I go, and I'm waiting for it to come to the theater here. I'm a little disappointed, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just didn't realize that he, that he dies off screen. You never actually see him get killed mm-hmm. by the demon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like. Well, that. and I think it plays into Father Karras's guilt that much more because if I was here, that wouldn't have happened. I could have helped him. Right. Um, his whole this whole movie for him was about guilt, guilt and shame. Whether he's losing his faith, he wasn't there for his mother. He can't really help Reagan. He needs backup. He leaves for a while. The guy that he admires gets killed or dies. You know, I think all of that, again, when you talk about pacing of a movie and you look at the character journey of each uh, character, everybody goes through this evolution, you know, where mom, Chris McNeil, is um, she's sort of disconnected from her daughter because she's going through this divorce. And she's got her career as an actress and all of this other stuff. But by the end, all of that sort of peeled away and it's just about her and her daughter. So she sort of earns back, you know, 
being a parent again. There's a degree of intimacy because of this journey. And Father Karras goes through the journey that he goes through, like I said, of guilt and shame. So it's like you could look to each character that plays a prominent role in the movie and just see how they're different people by the end of this than they are in the beginning. It's almost like they're exhausted by the time they get to the end. Like this was a fight that took them all the way to the distance and they barely got through and barely won. Sure. Even the, um, I forgot the character's name, but the, I don't know, like the live in nanny or assistant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her too, when she didn't want to go to yeah, LA. Yeah, exactly. She didn't want to go good. I'm good. I'm good. He's <laughs> like, I'm sorry you're not coming. No, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> yep, had enough. I always loved that. That's so realistic. And the, the the German housekeeper, I forget his name. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, he was the one that was fighting Burke when he was calling him names and stuff and yeah. call him a Nazi and all of that. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. That was cool. Uh, no rats. There are no rats, you know, when he went yeah, upstairs. No oh, I know there are no rats. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, Rodney, I have a question for you. Have you ever used a Ouija board? No, hell no. After I saw that shit, it was like, what is the game? <laughs> like, what is the game? I'm waiting for the devil. I'm trying to conjure the devil to come <laughs> to play with me. You know, I'm not trying to purposefully ask the devil to come. No. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Uh, are you a superstitious man? <laughs> I'm not superstitious, but then again, I'm not tempting fate as well. I you know, there's a weird thing of in every movie, the guy that's talking shit typically is the one that gets it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, we, we'll be fine. I don't care. Blah, blah, blah. He's the one that Jason gets. Michael Myers gets. He's that one. So that would be I mean. never. Yeah, well, well you, you, this, of course it's Cody. You know, <laughs> there's another thing with Cody is Cody will be there at the end while all of us are dead. Yep. and he'll be the one that tells the aliens about what humanity was. It'll be Cody, and they'll think we were all Cody. You know, like, this is what we were, and then they'll destroy the Earth. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, um. You know, again, it's um, sort of a really, really painstaking detail that they take with that movie on every level that um, I think I respect it as much as I like it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because you a lot of those movies (laughs) during that time, you know, they were they were really doing schlocky stuff, even though the 70s is my favorite period of horror films. But. Huh. They really took this so seriously in an era where you didn't have to take it seriously. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. What, what other? So we just did Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which was mm-hmm. 1972 or 73? Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe 72. I believe. Yeah. yeah. Which other fall in that? Uh, Dawn of the Dead, um, for sure. Yes. Talking about capitalism and commercialism, and you can get everything, but still not. Um, but still not be happy. I mean, I think that was brilliant putting them in a the mall and they could have stayed there forever and things would have been cool, but they wouldn't have been free. So for a little indie movie, it had a big, you know, big statement. But um, the Wes Craven movies, I think Freddie was in the 80s, but he made a bunch of other ones. Uh, Last House on the Left, um, it was Deadly Blessing. What else came out in the 70s? Um, it's a bunch of them. I wasn't expecting that question. So I, no, so you're no, asking no. me to go backwards. It's harder to go. It's easy to go forward yeah. than it is to go backwards at this stage of life. But the howling, I think that might have been in the 80s. Yeah. But early John Carpenter, I think yeah. Halloween came doing that. I think oh, Halloween was in 78. I'm just going down filmmakers. But all of those guys sort of um, set the standard for what we look at. And if you look at them, those are the, those are the ones that get resurrected. You know, yeah. those are the movies that we're still making Halloween movies. We're still making Exorcist still movies. Make, They're still yeah. trying to figure out a living dead, even though The Walking Dead is that now. Mm-hmm. But you can't not look at those movies that didn't see the impact that they had on like film history and horror in general. Absolutely. Uh, for sure. Is So is your love of I, I feel like like talking to you, I'm realizing a lot of your like your love for the seventies horror, you see a lot of that in your comics. Yeah. I mean, I'm always trying to, to remake what I loved and what got me to this place, the Stephen King stuff. Obviously the shirt have this in every color of uh, these shirts, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of those stories sort of, it's a weird thing about the seventies because the, the late sixties and the sixties in general, you had so much turmoil going on in the country. 
and passion. You know, you had the civil rights movement, you had the women's rights movement, you had the Vietnam rights movement, and oh, well, the Vietnam movement, not so much rights, but um, you know, so much political discourse. I think you were sort of um creating a world that when you look at the right and the left, you know, the seeds of that seem to be sown on a national level. They've always been disagreements in in that thing, but you didn't have television to sort of market it in a way to get people to to sort of be on one side or the other. All of that sort of happened around the late 60s and early 70s. And I think those movies had so much they were trying to say beyond just being scary and, you know, that thing that I love the layering. You know, I love the layering of the storytelling and the meaning. It's kind of like hearing a song that isn't just about love or isn't just about um on the surface what it's about you know it's about a lot more do you think the exorcist did it have like some sort of political meaning big pharma. i think it was against big pharma <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> uh, i think it was about faith underneath all of you know what we really believe in and i think a lot of times we're at a point in history and it was an episode of millennium called somehow satan got behind me that spoke to this where if you're looking at religion from a conventional sense and you're looking at good versus evil demons really don't have to tempt people that much anymore because we sort of are on auto drive whether we're talking about sex or violence or any of the things that typically were frowned upon in um in modern in christianity I'm talking specifically about christianity um and so there's a point when you can become so cynical as a society that you forget that there's something else that's happening. You know, if you believe that thing, that there is a God and a devil and all of these other things. And so it's easy to lose faith. It's easy to lose hope. And all of these people in this movie, these characters had to even Reagan, when she has helped me on her stomach, oh, you know, man. when they pull the, the thing up, it's like, there's still this desire to be human and to sort of live an authentic existence. And, you know, you look at that house in Georgetown, it's a nice house. When they have that house party, one guy's an astronaut, like everybody's sort of a dignitary. (laughs) Everything's great, you know, except this one thing, the devil's in the house in this little girl. And all of the pretense gets stripped away. And all we're left is really what we have, which is each other. So, I think if you look at it from that place in the roles of being a parent and a child and what's really real in life and what's really important, I think there was a point where um, the mom would have done anything to save her daughter. She would have given up anything to, you know, let her daughter be who she is. And you could feel her desperation. I think Ellen Burson's greatest, the greatest feat in this movie wasn't so much fighting the devil, but it was more of her getting us to believe that she was just out of hope. Like, please, I need to find somebody that's going to help my kid. And whether it's, you know, Father Karras, Father Marin, the the hospital, whoever, she kept going from place to place and just didn't give up. You're so much much smarter and more eloquent than I'll ever be. I said, y'all are hot. All of y'all are hot. Y'all are hot. hot. That goes your ability. (laughs) See the exorcist for what it is. You're just hot. And you're listening to Cody. And then when she vomits, you go, cool, that's some cool shit right there. And you take another hit. Not really. It's <laughs> under. Oh, oh. You, you might be right. And we're doing it all. We're going to do another. If anybody's listening to this, we're going to do a sober version. <laughs> like <laughs> nine tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be completely different. I'm not going to be talking at all. I'm just going to be observing. <laughs> this is the highest yesterday where we were talking. So, <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. Did you guys, so the first time, I didn't see The Exorcist like as a kid, um, but the first experience I have with The Exorcist is in Scary Movie 2 when they spoof it. Oh, yeah. You guys remember that? That's hilarious. (laughs) And that's my, like, that's like, so the party scene, like they spoof it perfectly, like instead of um, whatever song they're playing in The Exorcist, they're playing Mystical. Yeah. (laughs) They're playing Mystical Shake That Ass. Yep. It's, it's Andy Richter at the piano. It's Andy right? Richter, yeah. And then James yeah. Woods is the other priest. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Those movies were great. I worked on Scary Movie 5. 
What? Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. I did a rewrite on there. Not that I'm like, that's the proudest of my work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we haven't even touched about like, apparently like the filming of this movie had a lot of fucked up things. Yeah, people on. died. People died. So, I wonder sometimes when people say that, because they do that with Poltergeist too, that there's yeah. a curse. Oh, really? You know? heard, yeah, like it's a yeah, curse. I heard about the little girl died and Carol Ann, the girl that played Carol Ann, and then um, uh, the teenage girl that had the hickey on her neck when she drives back, she gets out of her boyfriend's car when the house is starting to flicker and stuff. And um, the Indian died. Um, Oh, and wow. from Poltergeist too, and then they start making up shit, you know, like <laughs> craft <laughs> services guys paralyzed now or whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> Do you think but, most of it is just like urban film, urban legend? I think it takes on a life of its own because it has the film has such an impact that anything that happens around it, you're almost looking for something to add more to it. Like it's like a magnet for anything. So many people love it. That it yeah. just kind of falls into a range of, um, you know, you almost want something to happen to validate how great this thing is. Huh. Yeah, because when I was like, I, I would always believe that like it's a cursed movie or something like that. But then when you look mm -hmm. into it, it's like so like Linda Blair like broke her back. But it was right. because the director was just like a, an aggressive director. So like he made them pull the rope harder. Yes. Like the scene where she's flailing is like her breaking her back. Like it's insane yeah. that they, that's like, but it's a crazy yeah. cut. Like it yeah. looks, it looks real because it is real. Yeah. Crazy. And well, William Freakin, he like he made the room like purposefully that cold. Yeah. So it, was, it was a refrigerated room. Mm hmm. Like, yeah. Yeah. That that smoke was real. They didn't add that in. Yeah. So it was like that's crazy. That's crazy to think that they like made that room freezing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it worked. Oh yeah. Oh no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, there's something to be said about like trying to seek genuine reactions out of your actors rather than, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes, I would have been cold, but just why well, you'll see a lot of black people <laughs> in that movie. <laughs> in that movie. <laughs> One, we would have left. You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have waited. I know my mother wouldn't have gone through all that. She wouldn't have gone through all that. I'd still be upstairs, like, spinning and shit. She have gone through all that. As soon as I spit the pea soup, you waste all that money spitting that pea soup out. And if the preacher would have just beat me with a bat, you know, if that didn't get me the devil out, I'd just be dead. <laughs> Um, the spice, the peace tube was such an amazing practical effect. Oh yeah, yeah. And it, it so had gross. a tube. There was a tube that was like right inside of her mouth to do that thing oh. when she lurches forward. It was, it was very, very effective. Very, very effective. Yeah. But all of that shit was like in that scene. It wasn't that scene. I think it was the scene before where um, she opens the drawer, the dresser drawer next to it, and he was like, "Do it again," you know, <laughs> in time. Yeah, in time. In yeah. time. Oh, that's so creepy. Yeah. Also, yeah. There's also a really creepy part when, um, God, I keep forgetting, not Father Karras, Father Karras. Maren. Maren, 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 Father Maren. Maren. Father Maren. Yeah. Maren! Maren. He comes in the house and she's upstairs yelling. She knows he's coming. Yeah, he throws the holy water on her leg and she gets cut. Mm -hmm. like, like opens. It's, yeah. It burns. So it creepy. Burns. Yeah. That whole movie is excellent. Yep. I say that to my kids sometimes. Um, the power <laughs> of Christ compels you. <laughs> they, they don't have the reference point, you know. But I say it just like that too to my kids. Uh, that's an iconic, iconic line. Mm -hmm. I remember last time, or I think the first time we ever had you on, you had mentioned, correct me if I'm wrong, that you like um, the Serpent on the Rainbow. Oh yeah, I love the Serpent in the Rainbow. Nice. That's another yeah. Wes Craven movie, but that was in the '80s, I think. But that yeah, I love the, the Serpent in the Rainbow. I watch Serpent in the Rainbow all the time. Do like that also like like so like possession horror and also like I guess for lack of a better word like voodoo horror like I do like skeleton. That's a people. harder one to do. Not yeah. a lot of people have done that well. I think the believers that had Martin Sheen in it. There's like maybe four or five attempts at varying success. But I thought the Serpent in the Rainbow was the gold standard of using that whole zombification, um, creepy, weird kind of. There's more happening here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, can I? Can we bring up? Because so I I signed up for your Substack, and you have a story mm. called Twenty Degrees Past Rigor. Oh, mm -hmm. that that's such a cool story. Is that ever going to be printed? Yeah, I'm going to yes. print that. I got to finish it, you know. And um, 
I got to finish. I got two more stories to um, to go through. But my talking zombies, you know, it's it's oh, you're always trying to. Well, I'm always trying to figure out a way how to do things differently, how to take some of these things. If you look at my vampires in Philadelphia, um, what Jason and I do is, yeah, it's a vampire. They still can't come out in the sun and you know there's some traditional things but they can leave their bodies in the coffin their spirits can go in different places and they're a little more thoughtful they're a little a te- little more attached to humanity and they say that openly and rice opened that door but i try to go you know and i run into the room but always <laughs> looking for ways to do things um, a little bit differently if i can add history to it or if i can add some component that i don't think you've seen or i haven't seen and this I do. Yeah. That's cool. I gotta check that out. <laughs> it's a really cool story. It's fun. Thank you. Yeah. Well, how many okay, so what we do here at Thomas <laughs> and Chronic, we rate things on what we have that is called the Joe Pesci scale. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Is that a six Joe Pesci's? Six mm-hmm. being amazing, perfect. One it's the weed. It's the weed. <laughs> <laughs> it's the weed. You'll find those things. It's like I like the way that you paused. To explain it to me because you <laughs> knew that it made absolutely no sense. <laughs> you were able to effectively, yeah. you know, it's like you took a minute. Like, this is Rodney. We're going to explain this thing. It's not going to make any sense. <laughs> but we hope he plays along. Go yeah. ahead with Joe Pesci. How many Joe Pesci's would you give The Exorcist? Out of 10? Out of six. Out of, out of six. Out of six. Out of six. Oh my God. Six. Yeah. Nice. I mean, I um, agree. Again, there, there, there aren't a whole lot of things that, hold up over time and i don't want to talk about the ones that don't for me because i still love what they did in the time that they did for me but it's really really hard to um make something that sort of stands the test of time it's um and the exorcist does that you know if you compare it to if you're going into the movie and you're a young person and you just want to see shocks you know, and the stuff they train you to today, the music tells you when something is about like it sort of spoon feeds the horror to you. Um, Exorcist probably won't hit you as hard as it does my ass. But if you think about the fact that it's so great that no one's been able to duplicate it again, sort of speaks to something, you know, and a lot of people have tried. I mean, how many ripoff attempts have there been oh, yeah. to do the Exorcist again and again and again in different types of ways? But there still is the original, and it's still effective, you know? So I, I got to give it six. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Wholeheartedly. Two De Niro's. Two De Niro's. Oh, oh, two De yeah. Niro's. Yeah. Two De Niro's yeah. and six Pesci's, you know? Because <laughs> you're always looking to evolve the thing. And one Scorsese. Scorsese is the cherry on top of it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, and you were talking... You were talking about how um, how it might not. I still, I think like like my son is just now getting into. He's thirteen. He's getting into horror movies, Mm -hmm. and I think I have. He hasn't seen The Exorcist yet. I think it would be too scary for him. I think it's much easier for even though like they train you for shock and violence and stuff. Now I think it's much easier to stomach that kind of stuff than this kind of dread and horror. Like, yes. there's a lot of death in this movie, but you don't see hardly any of it. No. And that's what makes it so terrifying. Well, I think the point of it is, is that when you see certain movies, horror movies, and there's so much death, you sort of, it's like real life. You kind of get desensitized to the death. But like in the thing, when you get to know all the guys and one at a time, they're starting to get picked off. Um, and you're almost hoping in a way that your guy, at least for me, my guy doesn't die. You know, I like this one. He was funny. I don't, oh shit, he's gone. Um, <laughs> it almost reflects what real life is in a way, mm-hmm. which is actually scary in a way that some of the modern, like Insidious or some of those movies, which are entertaining, but they don't hit you the same way because I don't see that happening to me. The Exorcist, you know, whether you're the child or the parent, has to me, touches upon so many primal things, you know, in us as people. And that's really, really hard to stomach if you're a kid walking in. You know, for me, Goosebumps and, you know, Creepshow on Shudder and and all of those things are great primers to be able to be introduced to horror in such a way that it doesn't traumatize you. You got to work your way up to the exorcist. 
Yeah. You know, you got to work your way up to it to be able even to appreciate the craft. If you don't know what craft is in a movie, you just go to the movies to see movies, which a lot of people do. I don't know if you get the full impact of what it took to make this movie in 1972. The commitment across the board from everybody. Yeah. Oh wait, I never I have to give a dark secret for this episode. I never oh, give yeah. a dark secret. So one of our things, Rodney, this is another dumb thing we have to explain. This is right. It's it's how you set yourselves apart. Nobody can copy off of this because it's like yeah, you know, we do we have four Daffy Ducks and they um and, a robot. and you know I, I would never think of that. I would never think to do that. I, I can't steal that. That's that is it. they've trademarked it. <laughs> Yeah, so ev- for every Patreon episode, we have to share a dark secret. Oh shit! <laughs> my first one, <laughs> my first one was I really love musicals. Um, <laughs> but we've got is that darker. a dark secret though? I think you get high enough that you virtually have liked everything at one point. <laughs> I just didn't remember that you liked it. But we have told some genuine dark secrets. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I wondered where this went. I wonder okay, so what I want to hear Anthony. It's yeah. Anthony's turn. I Anthony's think that's a good way to episode. explain how not so dark the dark secret could get. But <laughs> okay, so uh, so mine. So it ties into the Exorcist, right? So um, my my wife on our first date. Um, so I had read an article that if you're on your first date, if you go to see a horror movie, right, like your heart's going to be racing, right? So your date might not know if they like you or it's or they're scared. Either way, their brain, it doesn't matter to your brain. So I was like, okay, Ooh. this is good. This is how I'm going to make this first date really well. And we watched it. <laughs> hey, we're married now, right? So <laughs> Yeah, so, she can't go nowhere for a while, especially if you broke. <laughs> <But go ahead. laughs> There's no incentive. Really, uh, I went through with the ceremony. You know, if y'all got kids, we got kids. I'll stay. <laughs> so yeah, that's my dark secret. Uh, Is that you took her to a horror film? That was the secret. <laughs> you took her. We didn't, you, we didn't even go <laughs> to the movies. We watched it at my house. <laughs> Do you watch you it at your house? Her emotions, correct? Yeah, exactly. That's why okay. it started. Right, that's why right. it started. Because I'm like, that's more of a fact. You know, that's what <laughs> took her to a horror movie. So what, what, what was it? The exorcist? It was the exorcist. Yeah. yeah. Was specifically oh, picked, I specifically picked act? the exorcist. Did it, did it, the I only part, the only, she liked it, but the only part that really scared her was the phone scene where when the phones <laughs> rang, that was the biggest, that was the biggest jump. She's in the chat. Maybe she's probably asleep by now, but <laughs> <laughs> it does give me anxiety when people call me, to be honest. So there you go. <laughs> I understand the fear. Well, just think if you had a cell phone back then you know, and it was that loud, you would, I would judge you and the devil at the same time. <laughs> oh, we got to finish judging this movie though. We got to give our scores as well. So we could wrap this up. Yeah. I think it's an easy six for me. Easy six. Easy six. You know what? That's, that's a lot of sixes. That's six, 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 six. I saw that come. I saw that one. I saw that one. All these things have evolved out of yeah. nothing. Yeah. None of these things have but we're now in our you know, third year. In 10 so. years, it's going to be horrible. In 10 <laughs> years, it's going to be the worst <laughs> podcast ever. In all of our lives, I'll be living under a bridge just like you. Do we have a signal for Rodney? You know, he's at a Starbucks hotspot because he's homeless right now, and he's under a bridge. So we got him. Got him. But it is the only podcast that features Satan as a frequent guest. So. That's true. Yeah. That is, that's very, very True. There you go. the body of Anthony. We let the people know. Hey, big fan, Rodney. Big fan. Peace. Hey, thank you. I'll be asking for socks. You know, <laughs> Rodney said he'll do it, but he, could you send him some socks? <laughs> well, we, we want to thank you for coming on. We have some cool people in the comments saying. Clive says Ronnie rules so hard. Oh, thank yeah. You. Thank hey, you, thank is you, there anything you want to promote before it's you? It's the same shit I was promoting before. <laughs> 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 that has really changed. I can't promote Wintertime. That doesn't exist anymore. Um, oh, you know, man. Dude, I'm so was, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I no. That, that happens. After 30 years of this shit, you get used to things ending. It's like, oh, man, how do you feel? I feel like I can do another job. You know, <laughs> like, um, 
Yeah, I mean, Philadelphia is still happening, and you know, I'm doing Luke Cage and doing a bunch nice. of Star Wars books. Oh, you're doing Luke Cage? Black, yeah, December Luke Cage drops. Um, nice. A bunch of stuff. It's always stuff in development and all of that, but you know, I talk about it when it's when it's there. Nice, know? nice. Really forward to hearing about that. Yeah. Sure. Then I get yeah. my dark secret the next time. Yeah. yeah. I talk about how much I really hate Jason. You know, <laughs> I really, really want to hurt Jason. Oh my God, I ruined it. I guess I ruined it. <laughs> Jason's back went out at Comic Con, and I looked like I was really concerned, but deep down inside, I was like, ha ha. <laughs> that's what you get you know so but I got him I, uh, you need some aspirin man you need anything you want me to get you something okay yeah. no you good and then when he walked he limped away and I was like ah, yeah this is what yeah. <laughs> this is what it's all about exactly it is too much injured Jason. Jason's very fragile I don't know how much longer we're going to have Jason because Jason is very fragile. <laughs> if it's not his shoulder, it's his wrist. It's all like sissy injuries. It's not like real man injuries. Oh my God, I hurt myself. My hand, my hand. You know, it's that type of stuff. And I have to act concerned because if I don't, he'll text me. He, he didn't even look like you were concerned. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I was concerned. <laughs> yeah, he's a wuss. If they did a ranking, of um, I don't know if it's Joe Pesci's. What would you have? I don't know. Paul, Paul Rubens's of uh, Ooh, Paul uh, Rubens. Jason Ruben scale. Yeah, of, uh, you know, you would have to give him three just for his lack of um, toughness. <laughs> <laughs> That's you heard so it here funny. first, folks. JSA gets three Paul Rubens. <laughs> yeah, three, three Paul Rubens. Three Paul Rubens. You, know, yeah. you know, I think Paul Rubens said. His last words were, Jason is a wuss. And then, <laughs> <laughs> nobody will print it, though, because they, they don't know who the hell Jason was. But I think. I know. <laughs> Damn. Uh, that's you know, nobody nobody secret doesn't even count. <laughs> but nobody likes Jason at all. <laughs> Every time I go to Jason's house, his kids are like, Can we come? No, no, no. You got to stay here. You know, the, universe, the universe wanted him to be your father. So y'all got to stay here. Oh, so, man. <laughs> Thank you so wonderful much. Wonderful kids, though. Wonderful wife. Everybody's wonderful except Jason. Except Jason. <laughs> Would you not help him if he was possessed? Oh, hell no. I would go over there every day. I would go. He would be a better okay. version of Jason. He'd be far more interested than he is. <laughs> oh, my God. If Jason was possessed? Oh, my God. Oh, man. No, I'd sit there every day. I'd bring cards. I'd bring board games. I'd just sit there every day and, and oh, talk funny. to the demon. <laughs> Don't let him out. I like you much better. I, much better. Much better. I'd cheese and crackers and shit. And we just sit there all day. Uh, torture him. Torture him. I hope you're in there just like getting with a pitchfork or something. So, yeah. Oh, man. Brutal. Well, thank you but so true. much for coming on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rodney, you really are. You really are a gift to us. We appreciate yeah. you so oh, much. Man, anytime, man. Likewise. Oh. I think if Cody hadn't grabbed me early on, <laughs> it was Cody. It's like Cody. I've done so many podcasts and so many interviews and stuff, and I see people and you go to but but it was something about the headphones and Cody's voice. It grabbed me from day one. And I said, I'm gonna be doing this for the next 20 years. I don't know if I have 20 years. Uh, We're probably a few years in, so I don't know if I got 20. But a good 10, I'm gonna be here with Cody. <laughs> I love that. Love to hear it. <laughs> That's why we keep him on the pod. It's good. Yeah. You have to. <laughs> if Cody's gone, y'all know. We, we know. We know. So, talk to Jason and watch how your numbers just drop. <laughs> watch. Nobody wants to talk to you. So, you know, we have one half of the Philadelphia team, uh, Jason, Shaw, and Alexander. Everybody, you see like the Zoom just breaking down. <laughs> I told people at Comic-Con, um, if Jason signs your book, it's worth 30% less. Damn it. <laughs> so, you can get him to sign it. Cool. But I'm just letting you know, if you try to put this on eBay, people are going to say, oh, that's Jason Charlotte Exile. It's worth less. So, yeah. <laughs> True story. Oh, yeah. By the way, for anyone listening, this Thursday, we're coming out with a Philadelphia Volume 3 and 4 episode. We talked ah. about that. Yeah. Uh, for spooky we season. talked about Volume 1, Volume 2. Rodney's been on twice. 
We got a lot mm-hmm. of a lot of Philadelphia Rodney content that you could check out. So please do. Jason can draw though. That's the only thing. It's like God's <laughs> sense of humor. It's like God's sense of humor. It's like I'm gonna make him completely unlikable, but he can really draw. <laughs> not gonna give him anything else. You know. <laughs> <laughs> do you guys when you guys go on other podcasts do you always yes we do this, this, this is <laughs> there are people who ask for it there are people who come and they'll ask me a question about jason hoping that i say something negative about you <laughs> <laughs> and i usually try to fulfill their wish I try to fulfill their wish. well they were separated by like three rows at comic-con they couldn't be near oh, we each were other. And, I, and i told people don't go to g <laughs> don't go over to g <laughs> <laughs> there's, nothing good there. there's some art, but he leaves the booth because you know he's got to walk around. You can steal it, take his art. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, they lock you up, bail. I'm like truck. I beg you, bail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's weird. <laughs> oh, man. love it. Yeah, love yeah. it. <laughs> Thank you once again for coming on, Ronnie. Really appreciate it. Yeah, seriously. You're very always. welcome. Look forward to the next one. I guess I got to keep doing shit so y'all invite me to come back. Well, yeah, actually, we did have one idea. Mm-hmm. I think the time before this you were on, you had mentioned how uh, you were into WWF wrestling. Not I was. WWF. And you were also a wrestler. Me and Anthony. I wouldn't call it that. I was in a ring jumping around. <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> call I said this. Uh, it's on my Instagram. Someone was asking me about it. And I said, I went down to the the power plant, the WCW power plant. They had this thing where basically they would take $700 from anybody who wanted to walk in and just get in the hell beat out, beaten out of them. And I was one of those people. <laughs> um, the commercial made it sound like you were going to be the NWA champ, like by Friday. <laughs> but when you got there, you realized that they were just there. They got you. You know, <laughs> and they beat the shit out of me. They beat me so bad. And I was, as I was laying there sore, looking up, there, there's got to be a better life. There's got to be something else that doesn't hurt this bad. And so, yeah. That's awesome. That was it. That was it. It was Pistol Pez, Watley, Hard Body Harrison, who I think is in jail now. I think. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, the Sarge and Norman, what's his name? Norman, Norman Smiley. Smiley. Norman yeah. Summer. Yeah, Norman Smiley. And they would rotate and just yell at you and make you do like a thousand up downs and burp. I could do seven. So you know they yelled at me a lot. And then they would just come in and clothesline. Yeah, it was just hard. It was hard. <laughs> they just beat the shit out. But yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Well, we'll appreciate it, Ronnie. We'll see you on the next one for sure. Yeah, man. Yeah. You guys take it easy, Cody. You stay up, Cody. Okay, we I need will. you. America needs you, Cody. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough times in our nation, and we need Cody. And I'm signing a pledge to keep Cody here. If you guys ever turn on Cody, sober. <laughs> I, keep, oh, I keep two really effective ass whoopers in my pocket. <laughs> if anybody comes for Cody, you're going to see a different ride. Like, people yeah. think Yogi Bear, because he wears the hat and the tie, is like, he's not a bear anymore. Ooh. You know? Oh, it's kind of like that with me. You know, I'm still, <laughs> I can still be physical, yeah. you know, even though I talk a lot. So, anybody fucks with Cody. Now the fuck with Jason, oh. please. I can use his address. If I can put his address in the chat and his phone number and everything, I will. Uh. <laughs> Why'd you do that, Rodney? Because I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, so funny. Yeah, guys. Well, it's good talking to you. Always to be good. Continued. Hey, man. Yeah, Likewise, thank you so much. hit me up. Hit me up. We'll find something to talk we'll about. Do. Yeah, Have a happy Halloween. About. Happy Thank Halloween. You. Yes, we'll talk. Oh, when or, you're coming out with a comic with Exhibit, right? That's one of the... Yeah, Florence and Normandy. Um, I don't have any here with me. Um, yeah, we just... Um, the business of comics is really, really hard. But uh, yeah, I got a bunch of um, celebrity team-ups that I'm doing with a bunch of people. And uh, basically, just my friends that like comic books say, hey, let's do a book. But uh, nice. yeah, Alien Attack story in the hood on the corner of Florence and Normandy and um, nice. pretty cool nice. little story and exhibit is great. And um, yeah, a lot of fun. Awesome. Nice. All right. Well, Thanks take so care, much, Rodney. Rodney. Thank you. All right. Y'all take it easy. Stay up. Thank you. All right. You, you too, bud. Later. Peace.
Hi, you're listening to Comics and Chronic, and I'm Jacob H. I'm Cody Cannon. And I'm Anthony Iannaccio. And you can tune in every Thursday to hear new episodes of Comics and Chronic. And make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, at Comics and Chronic. That's Comics, the letter N, Chronic. We'll see you guys next week. Woo! Peace.